Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. I really needed this show today for my personal sanity. As you know, I am hooked on the idea of awe and wonder. Today, Terry Hershey and I talk about finding awe in the ordinary. Typically, the idea of awe seems to be often restricted to some sort of event like travel or museums. But in these days of COVID, travel and museums are no longer available. Yet, I'm thinking for the keen of mind, awareness of awe in the ordinary, everyday aspects of life can be easily discovered. I really enjoyed this conversation with Terry. He truly gets awe in the ordinary. It was Einstein that said, He who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. Wouldn't it be glorious if awe became an everyday experience? It is my hope, truly, that this show leads you there. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Terry as much as I did. So let's get on with the show. Yo, Hirsch, what's up, man? Charles, good to talk to you. It's good to talk to you. How's everything up in the Pacific Northwest? The weather forecast is uh, rainy and cloudy and gray, which is very rare. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, very rare. I put in the other day, we had a a gorgeous day with just a... One of those blue skies, you can't name the blue, and the sun was out. I mean, it's not warm. It's still in the 40s, but it was a gorgeous day. And, and I put that I had to Google what that was, and I found out it was called <laughs> sunshine. But... <laughs> I remember when I was in Portland for three years, and, and there was a time, there was a year there that um, it rained uh, 179 79 days of the year. That did not include the additional 100 days of dark and no sun. So you only had like a third of the year in sun, and no wonder everybody was ecstatic with sun. But it creates such beauty. You know, the trade-off is, I think, you know, probably in your case, the trade-off is well worth it, is it not? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's my favorite thing is to try to name colors, and the colors are blue here. That's funny. I was just writing poetry last night, just a little bit. I wasn't really, it was just a little tiny thing. And and I wrote green and I looked for synonyms of green because it was not the right word. Right. And I found emerald and I just found that I loved emerald. Words mean so much. So Terry, let me tell you about today. I personally need today's show. I need to get out I need to get my mind out of our current times of what our cultural dis-ease and disorder, and once again, remind myself simple beauty of awe and wonder in life itself, even in our quarantine life. Now, this morning, I, I knew what my topic was going to be, and I knew you were going to be the guest, but I read your blog this morning. Do you still call that Sabbath moment, or do you call that a blog? Yeah, I mean, it's something that goes out every day. So yeah, technically it's a blog, but the title is Sabbath Moment. Okay. But it's a different than your longer version on Monday. This one's called a daily dose. It's literally, I think of it as a vitamin for our emotional well-being, because to your point, it's a reminder about the stuff we forget when we get derailed by distraction and hurry. We lose track of our grounding, our bearing. So true, so true. I didn't think I could read them daily, and I've been reading them daily, so uh, kudos there, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. So this morning, your thesis seemed to be about embracing the ordinary. There was a lot of talk about embracing the ordinary, and while we both agreed there is such simple awe and wonder in the ordinary, we often miss it because we are too busy doing other things, you're too busy heading our direction, too busy trying to get there, 
And one other thing I would like to add, because I noticed it today when I was driving, instead of paying attention to what's going around me, the buildings that are passing me and the the hills and the trees, I'm a thinkaholic. So my brain is just, I'm driving by robot, like I'm the robot. In that process, so much is missed. What do you think? Yes, 100%. The first thing is because people say, okay, all right, I'll start looking for awe and wonder in the ordinary, et cetera. But they still see it as an assignment. So the first thing we have to do is we have to shift the paradigm here. As soon as I see it as an assignment, then I give myself shit and grief, the fact I can't see it. But the paradigm shift is uh, Abram Heschel is a rabbi said, we teach our children how to weigh and measure. We don't teach them awe and wonder. So one of the reasons I'm given over to so much mental consternation is because my paradigm is weighing and measuring. What did I get done today? What do I need to accomplish today? Why do we need to report that's successful today? In other words, I've already decided what my paradigm is. What would happen if I was asked different questions at the end of the day? Not what did you get done? But what did you see that, that made you come alive? It did your heart good. It made you glad. It made you smile real big. It made you glad you were in the present moment. It made you not look at your watch. Any of those things. Yeah, you know, that's a great idea because, you know, I know several people that like to write journals in the evenings on sort of gratitude list of journals. I know it works for people and I applaud them. It's just not not in my nature. But your question really does strike me. What did I do? do today, or what did I experience today that gave me this sense of just tiny things, like I get them from buildings, and I get them from planters, and I I get them from relationships, and I, I had a wonderful lunch with a, with a guy today, and it was just, it was so replenishing. I, I walked away with a sense of wonder that that we could connect at this level and the appreciation of it. So I, 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 I moved from all the tactics and all the details that we had to cover, and I moved into love for this man and concern for his situation because he's got an illness that he's working through right now. And there it was right there, and, and, by, and by grace, I was able to catch it. I was able not to miss that opportunity. Absolutely. And the, the thing about reliving that, too, at the end of the day, what did you today that allows you to be present is that it's just making space for that sense of gratitude again. And that's an extraordinary thing. That's a great gift. Because what you're, what you're doing is you're affirming the things that give you value and therefore ground you. Without, like you said, without it being a checklist of to do things that make me feel guilty and make me feel overly structured that I'm more yeah, important. because then you get those things where, uh, you know, the, and I'm, I have no problem with a gratitude journal. I'm, I'm, it's a good thing to start with, what are you grateful for today? But sometimes we get, it, when it becomes a kind of, you know, what are you grateful for? I've been in retreats. What are you grateful for? And someone says that. And, and you know, the next person's like, oh, my God, that's so good. You think that was good. Why do you hear what I'm grateful for? You won't <laughs> believe this shit. You know, dude. <laughs> so that, you know, then it's a contest. It's like, who's the most grateful? And then. We kind of missed the point. Isn't that most true in so many conversations? That you'll have a conversation <laughs> and somebody will tell you about just this wonderful thing that happened to you and you say, yeah, that's great. Wait till yeah. you hear what mine was. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. it's I, I really, I really um, agree with your idea of not keeping scorecards. And the idea of keeping scorecards will keep you far away from anything of awe. One hundred percent. So the paradigm shift is that. In other words, where do I set that down? And once I start to set the scorecard down, you you all of a sudden become aware of of things in your daily routine that you wouldn't have known, that you wouldn't have otherwise stopped to see. But you know, it, it doesn't happen accidentally. You have to do make a conscious choice to try to do this. If if you don't, you just fall into the same paradigm. Yeah, yeah. In other words, you, you can't be a victim of either gratitude or wonder. You can't be a victim of it. You have to be a participant. Ah, well said, Hirsch. Well said. If it becomes 
a guilt-ridden list, then you're a victim. But yeah, yeah, or 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 the thing that I have to see. Look, I finally accomplished it at the end of the day, kind of thing. You and I are very familiar with that in terms of the way many Christian churches teach people about Christianity. That the paradigm is that way. Yeah, and ergo, I fall into my new tradition of mystery. Absolutely. Mystery in and of itself, you don't have to solve the puzzle. Therefore, you're now free to simply be in the puzzle. That's called being in the present moment. Yeah, not only do you not have to solve the puzzle, if you try to solve the puzzle, it just it just eliminates anything you were doing. Yeah. That was, that was positive. Do you think all of this about that we're talking about about embracing the wonder of the ordinary, what does paying attention have to, how does that impact that question or that effort? Paying attention? Paying attention to your day, paying fully attention to what's going on around you rather than full attention to the ego, to the self. Well, the irony is when the ego and the self is you're not really paying attention to that. You're being driven by something. Uh, paying attention is literally a pause button. You know, I am here, it's now. Paying attention is simply, and I'm, it's not that I'm not, I don't need to tell you exactly what I see other than I'm here. That's the mystery part, you know. I have no idea what color that is I'm looking at or, or what kind of moon is rising over there. I don't know any of those specific things for paying attention, but I know is that I'm here right now, fully present, and it makes my heart glad, and the world is extraordinary. I mean, paying attention, that's paying attention. It, the little boy said to his mama, 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 listen to me, but this time with your eyes. So paying attention is simply uh, putting yourself in a place. What happens out of that, I, I mean, this is not, you're not going to be scored for it or graded for it. He wasn't asking his mom to be graded for something after that. He just said, be here. That's all he was saying. To just be here. But be all here. Yeah, be here. In other words, if your phone is with you, you're looking somewhere, you're not here. That's why one of the weirdest things about modern life, and we've had it in all of our businesses, something called multitasking. That's dumbass. I, I am incapable of it. I really can't do it. I, I was talking to a person yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, it was Tuesday, talking to my coach and just said, I do not have the bandwidth for multitasking. I have the capacity to go deep, but I can't go wide because if it has to go wide, I'm just lost in a plethora of, of confusion. Does that, mm-hmm. does that make any sense? Yeah, that's it's a, it's a good gift to have. I keep coming back to this. Let me quit using the word choice, but we have to make a decision to do that. If, if, if we are not finding awe and wonder in our life, then we're letting the tyranny of culture and the news and the downsides and the troubles that are going on in the family, the f- troubles that are going on in the office, they consume all of our attention, and we don't have the attention to look at the beautiful things on the way home and to... To drop that and well, it's not just yeah, it's not just the attention about that because you know some of those things are actually in other words they may be sort of real circumstances in our life and the world, but but they don't necessarily determine our either our value and what we're drawing from to to respond to or take care of. You know Joshua Tree National Park, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. So when I used to live down there, Zach was real young then. We take him up to Joshua Tree, right? They give you a guide, you know, when you pay to go in there. Things to do, things to see. And they give one for kids. Are you ready for what the kid one said? First thing, find an oasis in silence, spend 10 minutes there. This is for children. Ask yourself these questions. What did I hear? What did I see? What did I notice that surprised me? That was for children, oh, and the and the adults awesome. was a list of tasks. Exactly. Now that's awesome. You ask about paying attention. There it is. I you love shift that. the paradigm shift of the questions you ask. It never asks how many miles does it take to get through. It never asks 
what's the shortest route? It never asks when I get from here to here. It never asks you those things. Not to mention, that doesn't mean you don't have to get there. Mama, mama, listen, but this time with your eyes and your ears and your nose and all the other senses we have. As you're talking, it reminds me of, um, of an Albert Einstein quote. You know who sees beauty in the universe as much as anybody are mathematicians and are physicists because they see the complexity of the universe. When they see, truly see the complexity come together like Einstein and Niels Bohr and the guy that I'm following right now, Frank Wilczek, they just see beauty in the universe, unlike the rest of us, because in their genius state, they see a completion that we don't see. And, and Einstein wrote this, He who can no longer pause to wonder and stand amazed in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what we're talking about here? Well, yeah, 100%. And the thing is, it's just the, um, and the wonderful thing about that is, for people who have been sort of blinded or their eyes have been covered. See, it's, it's not like an assignment now to get past that. It's already within you. You know, this is no different than the, than the gospel thing about Jesus and the light. There's a bushel over it. Yes, and we've talked about that, that, that we do have, if, if, there's, if Jesus says we do have a light, and when there's a bushel over it, that means we do have a light. The light's there. already, the light's there. It's there. So, it's in, inherent. Yeah. And yes. so that's what the to, you, to the quote is, yeah, I'm just as good as dead, but, but the light's still there. In other words, I've just let the bushel be my identity rather than the light. Mm, well stated. Well stated. I want to get into the difficulty. I wrote one of my very first blogs, gosh, you know, I think it was like 2015 or something, maybe even 14, I'm not sure but was how Italy nearly ruined my life. And the idea was, I found, in just walking some of the main streets of of Italy, like in Rome, Florence, Venice, you're walking through a museum. You know, everything is ancient, everything is absolutely magnificently gorgeous, and so you're, you're caught up as as Einstein said, amazed or rapt in awe. And then the art, and then the pace of life, and the food, and then namely, you have never had coffee until you have had coffee in Italy. And I've taken Italian coffee and tried to make it here, and it just does not work. And it is like a whole different drink than it is here. And it's just... You sit there and you savor the coffee. You, you cannot help. You can't just drink it and go, oh, this is coffee. You drink it and go, oh, my goodness, what is this? I found in travel that it was easy for me to find awe and wonder in travel and less easy for me to find it at home. And now, and then I found places to, to discover it at home, going to film, going to concerts, lots of art museums, relationships with people and finding either highly intelligent or highly weird people and and striking up conversations with them. Most of that has been taken away in COVID. I'm curious how we find beauty and awe in COVID. And let me lead with an illustration and then we'll take a break. I'm doing some reading in Meister Eckhart right now. And, and Eckhart is a 14th century mystic, philosopher, theologian, and, you know, one of the most quoted men in this tradition. And he tells a story. Now, he tells a story of a European man who came upon a hundred marks. Now, I have no idea what a hundred marks is, but evidently, from the context, it was a lot of money. So I'll put it in our terms, and maybe I'm going to, to expand the amount of money, but Eckhart tells the story of a man who came upon $10,000. He quickly loses $40,000, and then all he can do is fret over the loss. Instead, Eckhart suggests, the man should simply focus on the $60,000 he did have, and he would be much better off. Too often, 
We put the focus on what we don't have than what we do have. And the story of dealing with loss and distress and suffering, when in times of loss, Eckhart says that we should consider the good things that remain, even if they're unrealized. And this seems to be especially true in this time of COVID, that you can't get out like you used to. And yet, awe and wonder exist. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I have lots of thoughts, before the break or after the break. Why don't we do it after the break? What do you think, Paul? Yeah, we'll do it after the break. Hi, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and I'm here with my good friend Terry Hershey. We are talking about discovering wonder and awe, rediscovering wonder and awe in our life, especially in a time when we have more confined lives and, and we don't get to see it out in nature as much or in, in museums or in films or in interrelationships with people. And so we're, we're now take, turning the conversation over to where do we find this wonderful gift of awe and wonder because we're so inundated with all of the, all of the mm, let me just say, crap that is going on and beauty and wonder and awe changes our very perspective of life. And I, I told a story of Meister Eckhart, and Terry has some comments on that. But that was before the break, Charlie. I've already forgotten it, but it, I'm sure it was a really good story. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot who I was talking to. I was talking to myself. You know, I have it written down. You don't. So I looked this up because I thought about I thought of a, an encounter I had with somebody. Tell me about that encounter. This is interesting. This is a letter I wrote to you 20, 25 years ago. Holy No, God. more than that. More Holy than that. God. The ones Longer you threatened to publish that I won't let you publish till I die. The reason I found it is because it's in one of my books. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I quoted Abram Heschel about don't teach children how to awe and wonder. We teach them how to weigh and measure, right? Right. So it's your Meister Eckhart thing. How do you see the sacred and the ordinary? How do you see the gift rather than the, quote, loss or what we're missing? And so I'll read this to you. And so it changes my question to what did I savor today rather than what did I lose today? Perfect. Um, some time back, my friend had the courage to tell me this is, that his life was in a decision-making brink mode. And he held himself back, not thinking he would be allowed into a life or world of abundance and permission and joy and grace. He didn't ask for my advice, and I didn't have any anyway but I wanted to write to him. This is back in the day when you and I wrote to each other. Here's what I wrote. I wrote this. I was thinking about your comments about being fragile or vulnerable. We talked about that a lot. Thinking that I didn't know what to say to you. Sipping my Dow's port while watching Monday Night Football, remembering the times in my life when I had felt on the edge or in some way susceptible to shattering, both shattered or shattering someone anyone around me and trying to remember what triggered those times. And I came up with zero, but if all else fails, I'd be more than happy to pour you a glass of port and offer you a chair on the back deck to watch the sunset over the Puget sound and hope for a little luck that maybe we'll see a bald Eagle float by and tell you that I don't know much, my friend, but that sure is a damn fine Eagle. Isn't it? Who knows, before the light gives way completely, we could wander over to the garden and take a hit of fragrance from the rose Souvenir de la Malmaison and marvel at the different ways the universe lets us get intoxicated, loitering in the moment, knowing full well that this drunkenness, like any other, comes with a price. The bittersweet reality that it can never quite fill the pit in our soul, even though it comes close. Or... We can stay on the deck and crank up the music and let Mr. Clapton fill the dark and empty spaces, swap stories as good friends, and hope that the angels are taking notes on recommendations for ways to make eternity tolerable. 
Holy cow, you ought to write a book, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> that was really well written. That was and it was it was so right on the mark. It was it was so right on the mark that there are not not necessarily answers, but there are approaches. So that yeah, that's the way of answering the question is that I, there's in other words People are going to get their pen down to, you know, you know, I get my pen out because I, okay, good. How do I, how do I shift gears here? But see, that's the point. What did you see today that, that did your heart clap? What did you see today that, that, um, that made you smile a little bit? What did you see today that lifted your spirits? What did you see today that made this day a gift? You repeated something earlier similar to that, and I just think it's such a grand journal question that it would be, in, instead of rehearsing what I did today, you know, the, yeah. say review your day and take an, in, you, you know, there's a, whole, there's a whole checklist thing, take an inventory of your life. Like, gosh, that's what I want to do is take an inventory of my day. It's, you know, it's going to suck. But if I remind myself that there was joy and there was some bit of awe and some bit of wonder and some bit of beauty and some bit of love, even as small as it may be, may it be Eric Clapton or the smelling of a rose. It can make the day. It can change the day. And it's in our spirit. I mean, you go back I and mean, think about all the great stories about children, you know. Um, you, you'd appreciate this because, you know, the kids, the kids are out, little tiny kids. We're talking three, four-year-olds. They're out with, you know, sticks and rocks, playing baseball of sorts. But mm-hmm. the adults go out and tell them, no, no, you're not playing the game right. And they try to teach them the rules for the game they're playing. And you know how many times when I was when I was um, coaching Little League Baseball and, and Club yeah. Baseball for kids, you know, 8 to 10 years old, and how many times the umpire said, I wonder how much how much better this would be if they fired us and they fired you and they just yeah. let the kids play baseball. Yeah. And I, yeah, I I, really resonated with what he had to say. I thought that was so true because we make it, and especially when we make it so emotionally damaging on kids. The competition part of it is a different shift. It's a whole different thing. But the game part of it, when my son was little, he played golf with me. He actually liked it because he had fun playing. Once it became a competitive thing later on in his teenage years, it wasn't as fun for him, but... Now, I mean, back then it was just a blast. But we'd go play on the little course on Bash on it. Near the, some of the holes, there's, in the summertime, there's big blackberry things growing all along the hole. So when they were ripe, Zach would actually, before he'd go hit a shot, he'd go over and pick blackberries and eat them. And then the other people were like, <laughs> what's wrong with your kid? He really caught it. All his, you know, it seems so like sick. all his life he <laughs> caught it, didn't he? I mean, he Yeah, it was so fascinating was... to me. What's wrong with your kid? In other words, <laughs> how come he's not lining up the shot and exactly. how come he's not over there yeah <laughs> worried about where he's going to hit i'm just going to go out there and swing it and wherever it lands i'll I'll deal with it i'll go there i'll go there and maybe black craze over there too <laughs> you know what i want to do is is i would like to just brainstorm i know you don't like to be i i know you have a, a real disdain for setting objectives or setting, we need to, here are certain things to do. What I would like to do is in our time of COVID, in our time of restricted, restricted movement, what are opportunities that you and I have found? I'd like to just share them back and forth. Opportunities that you and I have found that we can, in our personal home environment, environments, that we can find beauty, wonder, and awe in the everydayness, ordinariness, and sometimes super ordinariness. Sometimes there are days, like last, I'll just, I'll just start. Last night I was writing on this podcast because I, I knew I was busy today, and, and I was busy yesterday, so I was writing, I, I broke my limits, and I was writing a little bit later in the earlier in the evening, which I don't usually work at that time. But as I was walking through my bedroom, upstairs bedroom, there was 
a fabulous sunset. And fortunately, I caught it. And we have windows with shutters on them. I opened the windows and just sat there. And, you know, didn't didn't try to take photos, didn't try to take notes, didn't try to do anything. I just sat there and enjoyed it. And that was, you know, moment-altering. It reminded me of what we're talking about. This is what we need to be doing. And it was just... Yeah, and I think, and that's actually, um, you know, conversationally, that's actually more important to me, that story, than, um, for example, anything you decided with your therapist or anything you did with your business adventures. Although those are fine, I like the first story the best. And I like the verb caught. So why not make that a paradigm shift? What can I catch today that I didn't catch yesterday? What have you caught in the last couple of days? That have you been well, surprised? The interesting thing about interesting thing about COVID and not being able to get out. I walk every day, you know, several miles. That's out. Now I live in a different town because I'm off of Vashon. But I, there's a hundred acres back here without a home on it, without a house on it that you can walk through. And so you, yeah, you walk by the geese, and I mean, you just walk, and you find you're always looking for fun things. And I take pictures sometimes just because the way the light is, etc. But I, I like the way the light comes through windows. I, I like um, looking. I like checking out the moon every night because I'm always curious about that. I like the way the wind sounds. You know, I was with um, with a friend you know, a couple of decades ago and we were on on the Pacific Coast in in the Laguna area. And it was a rough area of coast. Now it's all private land, but it wasn't private land at the time. And it was rocky and waves beating against the against the rocks. And it was a cloudy what do you call it? Bursty wind? A gusty, gusty. Gusty wind sort of pushed you around and her comment to me I really like she didn't say I like this weather she says I like weather and I, I, you know yeah, that yeah, is that has struck great. for me for you with me for years I like weather that means she was she was this is she was paying attention but she was and maybe it is not exactly paying attention but but it is a some kind of openness to receive yeah. it's an it's an availability i'm available i have a handful of a, not a handful just two or three things that i i am doing currently that has just really surprised me with joy in my house that i don't have to leave my house to do it and i mm-hmm. am i am so enwrapped in awe that it's just yeah. it's just amazing and 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 i'll give you a couple examples there is a, there is a, we have to really be careful of the, of the serials and the TV shows we're watching. Some of them I'm finding so disheartening, so filled with violence and cruelty. I hate to use the term, but it really is evil. And, and I, I, you know, I sort of get into the plot and so we get stuck with watching it, but I find myself emotionally disturbed during it and after it. And so why do I watch it? I don't know. Masochist. But I have found a show. I don't know if you've heard or watched this show. I imagine you have. It's on Amazon Prime. It's titled Mozart in the Jungle. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh, Terry, do you get Amazon Prime? Well, you don't have to answer that. But but it's, um, it is excellent. It's with uh, Gael Garcia um, Bernal. You, are you familiar with him? He did no, he, uh-huh. he did e to Mon- e, e mama tambien with uh, Diego Lunas. He okay. was he, he was Mozart the other in the boy. jungle. And it's and he is a conductor that just takes over the New York Symphony and he is more of a prodigy but a proven prodigy. He is he's a really sought after conductor. He's Latin. So Gael is such a charming, witty, iconoclast that that it is just the way he conducts this orchestra, and the orchestra is a mediocre orchestra, and he's trying to make them into a world-class orchestra. 
But it is so fun. They're 30 minutes, 26 to 30 minute episodes, four seasons. And it is just, I just can't wait to turn it on because I am so enamored with Rodrigo de Souza is who he plays. And his character is just so nutty, so crazy. And yet he's a fabulous conductor. It is just. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't know the name of that show. I've seen that whole show. Oh, that's great. Is that where he takes them out, takes them out and they play in this one little park? Uh, the, the whole thing goes out by a fence and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, well, like they go ahead. Yeah. I remember that show. Oh yeah. It is. It is so worthy. I, I, I just found it by accident, but there's, there's shows like that. And another one, Ted Lasso, you know, I just, I, I think it's helpful to find uplifting shows. You know, we, we kind of poo-poo the feel-good shows and go for the deep drama. And the deep drama, I'm finding for me, is more destructive than it is enlightening and giving me that sense of awe and wonder. And, mm-hmm. and I think the other thing for me in the house is uh, obviously um, cooking is significant, making the whole cooking experience significant for me because all your senses are involved. I love that. Plus, there's music in the air. I love that. So, you know, it takes an hour to do all that. I love every bit of that. So, and that is family too. Every day. Yeah, of course. That's a, that's, that's an engagement. That's not, you know, you're not by yourself. Yeah. I mean, it is an engagement. If she helps, sometimes she doesn't. So I, we need to speak to her about that. This is really important. <laughs> but she, but you, my, my <laughs> guess is you still do the dishes. Yeah, and if you know how to if you know how to stack the dishwasher, that can be a sense of wonder too. It's oh, an amazing thing! I can't, I I cannot help my wife in that. She's a she's a front stacker and leaving the back open. And I'm trying to tell her you start <laughs> from the rear and move your way forward. But she says, "Nope, I don't think you're ever going to teach me that one." And I said, "Okay, that's that's good." But you know, there are because we do watch so much television. I I just think. So much television is destructive. You know how I feel about the news. I'm not, I think we need to keep informed, but if we watch too much, it is just too depressing. It would help. We don't need to. It would help our souls to do the Mozart in the Jungle and the Ted Lassos. And, you know, those those just happen to be ones that I've I've seen recently that are just so, so wonderful, so delightful. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't disagree with you. That's something that something that fills me up, but doesn't empty me. I mean, that's all part of the thing too, is everything about bombardment and distraction empties me rather than fills me up. Yes. Empties you and, and sort of jades you. Don't you think, don't you think it jades? Yeah, because I don't have any capacity to respond. There's no wonder I'm jaded. I'm jagged. I'm edged because there's nothing there to fill the spaces. Yes. And, and you're very passionate about these things as well. So that, that adds to the to the complexity of it. You know, another thing I found, and you, so I'm, I know we're TV watchers, and so another thing I found on TV that is really, really delightful, and my wife and I have kind of become really fans of it, and that's on YouTube, and that's going to live concerts on YouTube. There is nothing like great live music to impact your life, and and to impact to impact this sense of oh my goodness that was incredible and and there's a show out there I don't know if you've heard of it it's on YouTube called Daryl's House and it's with Daryl oh. Oates of Holland Oates and he has many many incredible artists that come to his home studio and record live recordings and it is the talent blows you away the music blows you away. And we listen to it two or three times a night for at least 30 minutes, just listening to live music. And it just does our hearts so good. So Absolutely, good. Absolutely, as it should. Yeah, there, there, 100%. There, there's just something about live music, even, even when it's recorded, something about live music that is so much more powerful than, than just simply CDs or, or no longer CDs, but streaming. Mm-hmm. So what else? What else do you have? Do you have anything else that you do that kind of habitually that that sets your mind at ease and 
and reminds you of the goodness of life on this planet? I read every day a book. You read one book a day? The whole book? But I read in the book. Oh, day. scared me. I, I knew I'm a slow book. reader. You just but made me feel words are, it Words are an extraordinary thing because words can take you to those places. Oh. Words can invite you to those places where you have been fully alive and grounded in words of wonder. Um, they, uh, in the same way that music can do the same thing, poetry can do the same thing. That's why Amanda Gorman was so extraordinary. Extraordinary. Poet. Yes. Is poetry can take you to that other place that may have been that may there may have been a bushel over the light, but poetry can take the bushel off the light, you know, and words can do that. And um, um, and we don't learn about that in our education, do we? We're we're you know we're, we're no, but no, you no, know, because we're we're because we're reading for the answers to pass the test. Precisely. And and we're reading, and too often we're reading poetry over our head. That it's you know well, it's not, it's not we're really reading it. We're reading it to to try to uh, explain it to someone else rather than just experience it. Because I'm so with you on poetry. I think I, we we just chatted the other day. Is that when I am going to bed at night, I was reading, you know, more, not serious, but well, more serious nonfiction. And I just said, I'm hitting information overload. I'm just getting too much stuff in my brain. I'm going to set it down, and I'm going to read some poetry by one of my favorite poets, um, Naomi Shahib Nye, and her famous book, Words Behind the Words. You know, poetry you can't read fast. You, know, you, you, don't, you don't read a book of poems really quickly because it takes me two or three times to read a poem. To See, but that's the other thing about it is every single one of the things having to do with stuff we talked about today and wonder, every single thing slows you down. Why? Because it stops you. It pauses you. It reframes you. It resets you. That's the thing about it is speed has nothing to do with any of the things we've talked about today. You can't do any of the things we've talked about today fast. Boy, it really comes down to our sense of um, of measuring and and creating a checklist in my in my app to doist, and I put read Naomi today. So check. No, it Correct. doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah. doesn't even make the to do list. Right. It would be a sin to make it to do to have it make the to do list. Yeah, I read Naomi today, and I was going to put her on the checklist, and I got a text from her and said, "Get me off your checklist." <laughs> uh, that you know, and that sounds like her. That would be funny, actually. She would do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Terry, this has been this has been so helpful and and so enlightening, and and I hope our listeners find the same that they find some, you know, we can find some hope in a, in the solace and the reminder of no matter what the state of the world, there remains awe and wonder, and we get wrapped Absolutely. up in it. Absolutely. Hey, Hirsch, thanks so much, buddy. Um, thanks, Charles. I certainly enjoy you being on the show, and, and this was a fun show today. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and, and I would ask you to please be sure to check out our website at thenextchapter.life. It's not .com or .net. It's .life, L-I-F-E. And on that site, you will find our weekly blogs and podcasts, and you can, if you wish, you can always subscribe and make it even easier to access to access either one. So with that said, until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.